Hello everyone. Whenever we have a patient with fever and we are not exactly sure what is causing it, we wish that there was a magical test that would somehow instantly give us the answer or at least tell us whether we should prescribe antibiotics. The closest thing we have to such a test is CRP, or at least we like to think so. How accurate is it? What is the optimum threshold? How high does it have to be for us to decide that the patient probably needs antibiotics? This question most commonly comes up in one of the following two scenarios. Number one, when we have a patient with what seemed to be a viral respiratory tract infection in the beginning, but now after four, five or seven days of persistent symptoms, we are worried about a potential bacterial complication like bacterial sinusitis or pneumonia. And number two, when we have a patient with fever and no leading symptom, no obvious cause of this fever. The normal level of CRP is up to 5 mg per liter. In uncomplicated viral respiratory tract infections like the common cold or uncomplicated influenza, acute bronchitis, it's up to 20 or 30 mg per liter, maybe occasionally around 50. In bacterial pneumonia, on the other hand, it's usually well over 50, but many times much higher than that, above 100 or 200. The highest that I've seen personally was 597 in a patient with Legionnaire's disease. But when you take a look at the studies on this topic, you will see that they come up with slightly different numbers. Most agree that CRP above 100 is a sign of a bacterial infection, but some move this threshold all the way down to 30. Of course, it depends on how the study was designed in the first place, what it's actually analyzing, but in general, with higher thresholds, so let's say 100, you get better specificity, but poorer sensitivity for bacterial infections, and for lower thresholds, it's vice versa, so better sensitivity, but poorer specificity. And it makes sense, doesn't it? With CRP about 100, you know what you're probably dealing with, it's the same with CRP below 10 or 20, but the area between that is sort of a gray zone and again it makes sense for a test with such a wide range of possible values you cannot expect a clear narrow threshold of course it's going to be more of a range not a single point so after reading all of these studies I'm still pretty happy with my personal approach where when CRP starts to approach 50 the probability of a bacterial infection starts to rise and the more it approaches 100 the more certain I am that I am actually dealing with the bacterial infection. But I always keep in mind that CRP is just one piece of the puzzle that I need to fit into the wider context. It's not a magical tool that will provide me a clear yes or no answer. Because simply defining a threshold or a range of dangerous CRP is not enough. There are several crucial points that you need to understand, otherwise this test can mislead you and ultimately do more harm than good. So number one, always pay attention to units of measurement. In this video I express CRP in milligrams per liter, but in some places, especially in American literature, you will find it expressed in milligrams per deciliter. So something that is 5 milligrams per liter is only 0.5 milligrams per deciliter. So it's quite a difference, right? Tenfold. So again, always pay attention to units of measurement when you read about CRP. Second, CRP needs time to rise and reach its plateau. It needs two to three days to reach its maximum level. And this is important for patients who present on the first day of symptoms. Recently, I had a patient with sepsis and bacterial meningitis whose CRP level was only 9 milligrams per liter. That's 0 0.9 milligrams per deciliter, right? So it was very low, it looked viral. How is this possible? Well, simply, the patient became ill very suddenly, he was rushed to the hospital right away, and by the time we drew blood, CRP hadn't had the time to rise to reach its plateau. So again, in patients who present very early in the course of illness, CRP might be deceptively low, so you cannot use it to exclude a serious bacterial infection this early. So as you can see, timing matters a lot, so let's stick with it for a while. In simple, uncomplicated infections, again like the common cold, bronchitis, influenza, CRP will rise slightly and it will reach its plateau again in two to three days. This plateau won't be very high, but it can be around again 20, 30, sometimes even 50. So if you draw blood on this third or fourth day of symptoms, you will actually stumble upon this plateau. And this can mislead 
some trigger happy doctors into prescribing antibiotics right away, which is usually the wrong thing to do. Because in uncomplicated viral infections, after this plateau, CRP will start to drop pretty rapidly, so by the 6th or 7th day of symptoms, it should be well within the safe zone, right? And it should be clear that the patient doesn't need antibiotics. If it's still around, let's say, 50 in the second week of symptoms, well then, this is unusual and I would seriously consider a bacterial complication. But in that case, most of your patients will have obvious symptoms and signs of complications like worsening fever, new worsening after an initial improvement, a productive cough with chest pain, anything. So CRP might not provide you with any additional information that you wouldn't have figured out regardless. And many studies actually found that CRP didn't provide anything beneficial in this context of respiratory infections. On the other hand, several studies found that CRP did reduce unnecessary use of antibiotics because doctors were more confident to withhold antibiotics when CRP was very low. Okay, point number four. Let's not forget that even though we most commonly associate high CRP with bacterial infections, it's not that specific for bacterial infections. Severe viral infections can lead to very high CRP. We saw that in the pandemic. People with severe COVID pneumonia often had CRP well above 100 and there was no bacterial superinfection. It was the virus all along. It caused a dysregulated inflammatory response that led to widespread tissue damage and very high CRP. There are non-infectious conditions that can go with very high CRP like massive thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, cancer, autoimmune diseases, major trauma, major surgery. And this is a huge problem for us who work in hospitals. When you have a patient who recently had a major surgery, it's very difficult to use CRP to both exclude or include an infection. Which brings me to the final point. Since timing is everything, always keep in mind that a single CRP measurement is just a snapshot. It's not the whole movie, right? What is even more important than the absolute level of CRP is its dynamic. It's how it changes over time. And this is why CRP is even more useful as a tool for monitoring the response to treatment than it is as a tool for differentiating between viral and bacterial infections. In hospitals, when we start antimicrobial therapy, we repeat CRP in three to four days. If it's not dropping, we tend to think that this is a sign of treatment failure and a sign that we should change something. Either use a different antibiotic, look for a source of infection that needs to be removed, or even reevaluate our initial diagnosis. I talk more about CRP, Percocetonin, the CBC and all other tests in my free online course about recognizing serious infections early. I created this course for my fellow clinicians who have to make quick decisions based on limited information. I highly recommend that you take a look. In conclusion, CRP is very useful, but it's meaningless without the clinical context. It needs time to rise and reach its plateau. It can be elevated in non-infectious conditions. Its dynamic is as important as its absolute value, and you should always pay attention to the units of measurement. Thank you for watching, good luck out there, and take care.